SnapDeck IT is the expert go-to resource for all things CMMC, education, certification, preparation, and ongoing managed IT. Manage, secure, grow. Check it out at snaptechit.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of 123 CMMC. My name is Dana. I will be your host. And today, our guest is the ever so lovely Carl Bickmore. Hello, Carl. How are you? Oh, I'm well. I'm ever so lovely. Well, then you must be lovely, too. Thank you. <laughs> we'll both be lovely. <laughs> All right. Sounds All good. right. Exciting topic today. The importance of zero trust for DOD contractors. Mm. Yeah, this is like a lot of... Uh, things that we've seen come through tech. It's a, it's a bit of a buzzword these days that's starting to gain steam. Mm -hmm. So our first question is, what is the zero trust model? Oh, okay. Well, you know, like uh, you might find out there from vendor to vendor, they have different definitions of the word uh, of cloud computing, for instance, or uh, other things that you might find out there. This is one of those ones that you might find different people have a different term or what they mean different things. To me, at the most fundamental level, a zero trust means that whether something is in your network or out of your network, if it's going to access any resources for your organization, it must be expressly forbidden except when expressly approved. Meaning um, rather than the traditional model that, that happens in networking where everything is accessible except what's blocked, everything is blocked except what's accessible, okay. if that makes sense. Uh, that makes so, sense. So nothing is allowed except what is 100% identified and known. Okay. All right. So how are traditional networks typically set up when it comes to access? Well, you know, I think it's uh, not just networks, but it's computer operating systems true as well. I mean, I think the zero plus uh, zero trust model applies in a couple of different ways. Like you'll find out there folks talking about zero trust networking access or ZTNA or uh, zero trust as an application control on an individual computer. Uh, and both of the both computers and networks were originally created to simply do what they can do. In fact, uh, security measures in general are always really just putting up blockades to make sure it's done securely. But by def the default nature, if you go into an organization and plug a laptop into a port and that port is connected to a switch, that switch is connected to the network and the rest of the, fi the firewall uh, data and, and the rest of the servers and workstations and also the Internet, by default, everything is allowed. There is nothing restricted whatsoever. The in original intention of the design of these things was how do I make it functional and high performing? Uh, and, and so uh, this new model that's coming about is realizing how drastically risky that can be when, for instance, on a computer, any application script or browser add-on can run, or within a network, any device or remote user can make its way into the network and then have no restrictions in getting around. Uh, and so um, a really common approach, for instance, uh, to remote access is to connect to a VPN first. And then once you get that VPN access into a network, you uh, can get anywhere in the network, like your computer to just plugged into a port in the building, no restriction. Zero Trust would take a different approach that says, OK, even if I'm going to let you in, I'm going to double check who you are through a couple of different things. Like, do you have good antivirus? Do I actually really know who you are? Do I have multi-factor authentication? There's checks on your identity. But then after you get into the network, you're still only going places expressly for you are approved. That way, uh, it's actually higher performing because you're not spreading as wide of a net. But also, it's way more secure because even if you connect to the VPN in this scenario or the replacement of VPN, the ZTNA solution, you still can only get to a specific allowed application or a specific folder or a specific area. And all the rest is protected from anything you might introduce to that network. So you can imagine the level of protection here goes up considerably cons when you consider how traditional networks set up, essentially being wide open. If the initial protection on the perimeter doesn't stop somebody from coming in, then they can run rampant in the network. So that's a very good point in, in talking about how these systems were designed, right? They were designed for functionality and you know performance, and now we have to protect them. So it's the afterthought of things. But but that's very interesting in the whole. There's that's obviously a big difference between zero trust and just you know letting anybody and everybody in. So thank so you for that. Sometimes the when I'm referring to customers, I call it, it's reversing the default mode of operation. Instead of everything being allowed and trying to block the bad guys everything's denied and only allowed what you know to be the good guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just talked about this the other day, right? It's like the bouncer that doesn't let anybody into the bar. That's and like, right. Him yeah. 
having security inside trying to find out if everyone's behaving themselves. It's a very similar concept applied to application control like we talked about before and now applied from a networking perspective of what devices and resources you can access in a network. All right. Can you give viewers an example of how traditional networks work within with threats outside of the business? Oh, yeah. Well, look, um, I would say that the vast majority of any kind of uh, ransomware attacks or um, hacking attacks we see today are actually taking advantage of the fact that networks work in a traditional method. And so all they really need to do is break the perimeter, find access through the firewall or through an email or through a web, web page to the internal network, then spreading laterally is actually not very difficult. Uh, you know, I can tell you, we've seen a couple of times when we've looked to onboard a new customer and they've got fully functioning antivirus and, and even decent versions of it, uh, fully functioning firewall, uh, but uh, attackers had found their way into the network through what I would consider legitimate paths, not legitimate for them, but what an employee might use legitimately for, say, remote access. They found their way in through a compromised uh, uh, password or even maybe through an exploit, which is a lot more rare. It's usually social engineering that leads to it. But they find their way into the network. And then as soon as we begin to put restrictions on the network and threat detection in place, we find that there's an actor fully functioning, beginning to export data, preparing for their attack, or sometimes we're coming in after the fact when the attack has happened and we can find evidence that they've been there for three months. Um, a zero trust network solution would, uh, would be a far better protection against that. It's still not detection of somebody in your network, but it's way more comprehensive protection because it's about denying everything no matter what, unless expressly approved which means that if an attacker got into your network and then tried to, for instance, run a script to go across the network, the ZTNA program would block that traffic. So even if they made it in somehow in some way, the zero trust model would then prevent further expansion or getting to the goods, if that makes sense. And so, you know, real world examples. Well, I think the, the way that networks are currently designed is one of the, the primary reasons attackers are successful today that they, they have to rely on some pathway into your network, but it doesn't have to be straight to the goods because they can then move laterally and zero trust networking access or application control in a zero trust model would prevent that lateral movement that actually makes their attack successful. Now, just real quick, we talked about this a little bit when we talked about the um, application security. So does this, as far as the end user, the person on the computer, does this cause problems when they are trying to go, before you said that you look at logs before you implement something like this, is that the similar kind of a thing that you would do in this situation so that when it gets launched, it's not, no one can get into anything? Oh, yeah. And look, it has to be implemented with care, right? You have to really make sure that the restrictions are correctly. It is still a bouncer. Now, instead of a bouncer for your computer, it's a bouncer for your network. And ideally, you have bouncers in both places, right? Uh, it, you know, be it on the network or uh, for the computer. But just like um, any anything else, when you implement it, um, you can make mistakes and lock things up and, and make people uh, have problems getting their work done. Uh, so it does take care. It does take expertise and knowledge in the solution mm -hmm. and an ability to count and know exactly what's going on in that organization so that you don't forget or miss something that was maybe noticed or explained or, or brought up earlier. And so you do want to typically go through some type of parallel deployment where you deploy it, you watch, you look, you validate, you do testing, you prototype, and then when ready, you, you roll it out across the board. But I could say the good news is if you get it right, the end user's experience with ZTNA is actually typically better uh, because a lot of those technologies are more modern than, say, a VPN remote access. And because of the nature of them not being as comprehensive in what they do, they're typically better performing. And so a lot of folks are actually having a better experience with zero trust networking access because their connection is faster and they're, they have permission to do what they need to do for their work. And they can't accidentally get into areas they didn't mean to, but they can do their work. And so it just feels faster and easier. And so, you know, this is an area where it done correctly can be a real win win as well, particularly on the zero trust networking access. Well, that's always good. It's good for yeah. helping sell it to the uh, end users. Yeah. All right. How does the zero trust model differ from traditional networks? We kind of touched on this a little bit. Well, we've yeah, we've really, really brought that up. It's like, look, it, instead of everything being allowed and then trying to put things in to block the bad guys, you mm -hmm. know, uh, it, it's it's now everything is blocked. 
and you uh, uh, now do not allow traffic across your network except that which is expressly known and permitted. Mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, um, just completely changes the reverse of the default mechanism, which is just, once again, far better protection. Mm -hmm. All right, so here we go. So do you recommend that DOD contractors looking to be CMMC certified adopt a zero trust model as their approach to cybersecurity? Well, yeah, so CMMC is fundamentally building off of the principles of the NIST controls, the NIST 800-171 controls uh, and the 172 for level three. The, um, those controls basically say, hey, you need to protect your network in the five categories of identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And to me, this is a really great answer for the things you need to do in the protect realm uh, of the CMMC controls. And so there's a lot of controls when you're getting into protection where they're asking for something that the zero trust model would be the best way to accomplish that. Now, there may be other acceptable ways to remediate things, but less comprehensive. You know, for instance, remote access with VPN and multi-factor authentication might be acceptable today, but in the future, the zero trust stuff is going to be a lot better protection for remote access. And the reality of it is, is I'm seeing lots of rumblings. Like, you know, I was in a meeting with a customer last week and their auditors like, hey, well, tell me about your zero trust initiative. What are you thinking about doing and how is that going? Because uh, even if it's not specifically stated that the type of remote access you set up in a control needs to be zero trust, it is becoming widely expected that that's the best way to do it uh, from a practical standpoint. And so um, it's, it's it's very helpful for answering controls around protection in your environment. And I could see a future where the controls begin to call out specifically that it's using zero trust technology as opposed to just traditional VPN as an example for remote access. That makes sense. It makes sense. And especially there's more and more remote workers every single day adding on to, you know, since before COVID and now with COVID and afterwards. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, remote work definitely uh, feels the pain here. And actually it's brought out the pain of the traditional VPN style method too, because it's typically slower, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So here we go. Many DOD contractors aren't equipped with the resources to implement a zero trust model. How do you suggest they begin? Yeah, look, I think the, the key thing here is, is that uh, folks in the defense industrial base, uh, many of them are subcontractors to prime subcontractors, and a lot of them have um, a small IT team or maybe even fully outsource their IT. And so they internally just particularly don't understand Zero Trust. So hopefully this you know helps them understand a little mm -hmm. bit of the questions they need to ask and who they can go to. But their, they, um, their IT team may not understand the model or may not be familiar with the technology. And it really does come down to having expertise in the tools, delivering it. You got to know things around networking. You got to know things around security. You got to know things around end users and their access. Um, and then the tools that provide zero trust architecture. Um, and so uh, for a lot of them, a great answer is going to be to work with a consultant that specifically understands and knows this or work with an outsourced provider that has this in their tool bag that they know how to implement and implement well in efficiently and in a cost basis that works for them. Um, I, I think the biggest thing is just understanding you need to be asking questions about it and you need to be figuring out when is the right time to look at your network with a zero trust model and what initiatives you can kick off. Maybe you don't do it all now, but there's some really very practical things you can begin right away. You just simply need to have the right IT resource that knows how to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also like this short little video now, hopefully somebody that didn't understand at all what Zero Trust was, watched it, is not as intimidated as it, and now can ask intelligent questions about it if they're talking to somebody. Yeah, I, I think the key thing is just understanding this. it's a new thing and it's different, right? It, it Even maybe even a buzzword, maybe somebody may have said, hey, you need to do this and they don't know what it is. So a little education around it goes a long way. And then understanding that, if people keep saying, hey, keep doing this traditional VPN or keep doing this traditional endpoint protection, keep doing it. If they keep doing what they did 10 years ago, that they may not have the best approach appropriate for today's environment. So be asking yeah. questions and about what new things are being done from a security standpoint uh, with your IT team or your provider, whoever that may be. Yeah. Well, this was great. This was very, very helpful uh, advice and wisdom and all that. Is there anything else you want to throw out there before we go? Um, I just throw out there, if you have any questions for the question, you're always uh, welcome to reach out to me directly. Um, you can uh, go to our website, snaptechit.com, 
If you want to look up some of our resources around CMMC or compliance or computer security in general, snaptechit.com forward slash resources is a good spot. You can get there from the homepage too. So feel free to reach out, LinkedIn, our webpage. We're happy to engage and uh, answer any questions. All right. Well, thank you very much, Carl, for your time. And thank you everybody for watching. And we hope to see you on the next episode of 123 CMMC. Until then, bye-bye. Yeah.